Thank you very much, Jana, for that kind introduction. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about domain specific languages uh, and modeling, and specifically on, on some things called equation based languages and, and also on probabilistic programming. So, um, so the again is that I'm going to start with the, setting the scene a little bit about domain specific modeling language, what it is and why it's it's needed, and and then dive into what's called equation based modeling, and then take the other kind of domain specific modeling language called probabilistic programming, uh, that is more like a family of, of language rather than one language, and then I will say a few words on an ongoing uh, project that we recently started that is related to these things. Okay, so domain specific modeling languages. What is, this, what is that? Well, the, there are many things there. So one thing is that what we do in our group here is that we have a combination of different areas. So we're looking at the combination of programming languages and compilers together with how it can be applied to cyber physical systems or real time systems and then make use of machine learning, specifically Bayesian uh, theory and uh, probabilistic reasoning, and combine these things. So what is the key thing here? What is the essential thing for that is a common theme for all of these parts? Well, it's, it's, it's about this. So what do you see here? It, it's, it's, it's a map, right? And it's a map of a subway in Stockholm, an old map. And here you see a, a line between Chista and Okus Hall, and you see between Kungsträdgården and Odenplan. Here's another map between Chista and Okus Hall, but now you see the distance here between Kungsträdgården and Odenplan is much shorter. So what do I want to say about this? I, I mean, these are maps and these are models, right? So these are models, they are abstraction of the reality, but there are here you see two different models. One is showing how different subway stations are connected, whereas the other one is, is actually correct scaling, but with the one to the left is not correctly scaled. So there are different views of the world, in this case, Stockholm, but it's an abstraction. So this is the key thing that we have, we are talking about models that are abstraction of something, typically some sort of system. So why do we use models? So these, these are some thoughts and inspiration when working together with, especially Edward Lee in, in Berkeley, but also Francois Salier uh, on, on thoughts about models. So we typically have some sort of system and then we create some sort of model of that. But the viewpoint can be different in what, what, what we are trying to do. So if we are thinking about more a scientific viewpoint or a more engineering viewpoint on models. So, a scientist, say in natural sciences, try to model something to understand it. So, so the system already exists, say a frog or a human being or the planet. It already exists. We're not constructing it, but we create models because we want to understand it. We want to be, be able to analyze it. We, models still is an abstraction, right? It's not the whole system, but an abstraction of it. Whereas engineers, we typically do the reverse. We have some sort of model like a blueprint of what we're trying to construct. Maybe we make some analysis of it and then we construct the real system. So maybe we could have this model constructed beforehand so we don't make, stake, make mistakes when we create the real systems. So in both cases, we have models which are abstractions of systems, but we're using them in a bit different, in different, different ways. So, so one important thing here is that we would like to be able to do experiments or do analysis on the models instead of the real systems to pose questions and get answers. So, so the reason for that could be that it's, it's cheaper. Maybe it's cheaper to do an experiment on a, a model of a landing gear instead of, of actually using the real physical ones. It might be too dangerous to do it in, in reality. Say that you are trying out different parameters on, on a, a nuclear plant, it might be good to do that on a model before you actually try it out for real, right? It may not exist, right? So you can make, make an experience before you actually created it. And it might just be easier to do it. So these are different reasons why we do it, but it's good to keep in mind that we use it for different purposes and that they are really abstractions of something. Okay, so 
we talked about the map as an example of a model, right? So there is a pretty famous uh, expression here saying, you will never strike oil by drilling through the map, right? So, so you, you cannot drill through the model to gain what you want. So it's important to make a difference to see what, what is the model and what is the reality. So it, it, it's, it's another thing that people, you, you fall in love in the model. You, you basically see that, oh, it works so great and you stop to, to correlate the model to the reality and you get really, really good results. I mean, this, is, is, this can be a severe problem in, in science. So if you keep on that way, you can get false positives, basically drilling through an oil. So models are described as an abstraction. And there are different kinds of models. You can talk about probabilistic models. You can talk about models like the, where the model is just a differential equation describing some dynamic behavior. Models can be state machines. It could be time state machines. You can do model checking on such a machines. You have uh, data flow models and so forth. There are various different models. And, and they are expressed in some sort of formalism, giving the semantics of these models. And we will use the term here for domain specific languages, DSLs, as a language where you describe this kind of formalism. So uh, domain specific languages has been used for quite some time. So this is Van Dersen uh, from 2000. He defined it as follows. A domain specific language, DSL, is a programming language or executable specification language that offers through appropriate notations and abstractions, expressive power focused on and usually restricted to a particular domain problem. That's kind of long. Um, what does it mean? It, it means that it's, it's specific for a specific domain, right? So the contrast to DSL is what is called general purpose programming language. Uh, so say Python, C++, Java, or so forth. They are also languages where you can express things. Actually, these languages are, are Turing complete. So you can express everything that is compute, computable. So basically, sometimes I hear someone, why do you care about domain specific languages? You can do this in C++. And the answer is yes, you can do everything in one Turing complete language. The, the, the question is how easy it is to do, how safe can you do it, and did you know that it's going to be correct, and how efficient will it be? So why we want to have this more domain specific is, is for different reasons. Some, some reasons are, for example, that you want to use abstractions that are familiar to the domain experts, so it becomes easier for them to use, use the language, to use the thing. Typically, you want to be more declarative. You want to be describe more what you want to express rather than how. So you can leave out details. And, and, and by doing that to be faster and, and, to, and, and simpler to express certain models. And potentially, if you restrict these languages, you can also enable faster analysis. That means faster inference or faster simulation and so forth. And potentially, it depends. Okay, so we, we, we talked about model as an abstraction and we've talked about programs. So what, so what is a model and what is a program? And it kind of gets blurred when we talk about certain of these domain specific languages. So, so I, I have kind of defined what I call a programmatic model. And, and the definition is based on Minsky's definition originally about what is a model and what is simulation. And then also on Loris and Schoen who basically introduced the term programmatic model in, 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 the, in, in, in the sense for um, probabilistic programming. And here I, I kind of make it a little bit more general. So what I mean by a programmatic model here is, is a computer program where its behavior describes an abstraction of a system, S, such that the analysis technique, A, can be performed on model N, on M to answer question about S. So the model, programmatic model, is something, is always an abstraction of a system. But you use it to answer questions about the system, but you do the action analysis on the model. And a key part here is it's programmatic is that it's a computer program. So, so you can think about the model can be a static model, 
but a, a program is more expressive. It, it's actually a computation. And this will come, we, especially when we come to probabilistic programming, you will see that there are, this expressiveness enables more, more expressive models. Okay, so if you look at the overall challenges, what I, I try to do and what we try to do in our group is basically two main things. It's basically how to create reusable languages and constructs and tools so that we can make rapid development of domain specific languages. I mean, you can always do it from scratch every time, um, but that takes a lot of uh, uh, effort. Um, another aspect is that we want to automatically generate efficient compilers so, so that you don't want to be, have a, to be an expert on compilers to be able to define new languages. So there's always a trade-off. So typically, if you, you try to make it very expressive, the language, then, 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 then it might be hard to make it really efficient. And if you limit it, the expressiveness too much to make it efficient, you might not be able to express everything. Or maybe you can express what you want right now, but typically when you give a tool to a user, they find all kinds of ways to use it. And, and you don't want to be to limit it. So it's, it's always this kind of design. Another aspect is the, the trade-off between the, the domain expert and the compiler uh, and language experts. So, so typically a domain expert, say in mechanical engineering or in biology, they are not compiler experts. And, and few compiler experts know very much about, bio, about biology. So this is kind of a challenge when you're working in this space to, to actually get both, because you cannot construct good domain specific languages if you're just a compiler writer. So what, what we try to do, we, we focus on, on methods, algorithms, languages, and software tools for, for DSLs. And we also have a policy to do everything open source. And then I collaborate with other groups that are domain experts in their, their fields and try to develop new DSLs, domain specific language in their field with their domain knowledge and with our methods and our tools. So this is both try to invent new DSLs that can be really useful in, in these domains. And uh, as also as a evaluation of our approach and show that it actually makes sense. So I'll give some examples of some ongoing projects here uh, later on in this talk. So of course, there's a lot of things done in domain specific languages. There are people that are, of course, working, you can work on scratch. There are different tools to write compilers from scratch or tools to help writing compilers from scratch. And there's a lot of work done in, in embedding into other languages, especially in the Haskell and Scala communities. Uh, also other works on, on template, pro, uh, template languages. And, and there is a whole community working on DSLs. Uh, so it's basically, it's called language workbenches that where you can create domain specific languages uh, where you get complete environments and so on. Most of them are focusing on, on the domain as other software engineers. So what really, what we are targeting is, is other kinds of domains like uh, statistics, biology, mechatronics and so on. That is kind of our focus. So I'll say some, a few words about a, a, a system, a framework that I've been developing over several years, and then on, uh, on this ongoing effort. Mike. Okay, so the, um, if we look at some different example areas, uh, for example, autonomous vehicles, smart in, uh, industries, industries, satellites, container automation. These are, are some of the areas that uh, we have some ongoing uh, collaboration with. Uh, if we look at other things that we are collaborating on is, is in evolution biology or polynetics and public health. So as you can see, the first ones there are really examples of more cyber physical systems, the engineering view of, of, of models. Whereas the second part is more on the more scientific view, as I explained before. So let's jump into part two then, which is more on, on the equation base and more on the cyber physical part. So the CPS system, if you look at the system, what is that? Well, it's a physical system. And then you have some cyber part, the computational part, typically connected in, in a network. You have sensors and you have actuators. 
And then you can create models of these systems. But there are different kinds of models. So on the uh, cyber part, the, the computation part, you have different various models of computa computations, could be process networks or finite state machines and so forth. But on the physical part, it's different kind of models. It, it's typically some sort of equation-based languages when you want to describe the dynamics of the system. And this is also the focus on, on this, this, this part. Because if you have both of these worlds, you can do testing, you can do time aware simulation. Sometimes you can do co-simulation. And, and, and that means that you can study the behavior of the whole system at the model level. It's still, it's not the system, it, it's, a, it's a model. Uh, and see how it behaves. And this is, is, is typically how people are doing this in industry, say in, in, in car manufacturing in the industry, when they study the behavior of different components. And, and of course, you can do different kind of analysis also on models, like for model checking, if, if you do that on the computation part. It, it's, it's really hard to do this on the combined cyber physical system, even though there are some research in that direction. Okay, and if you look at this combination, you can also see how, how the the model here uh, can be simulated. And if that is simulated in real time and the actual cyber part is executed on, say, an embedded system, then you can do something called hardware in a loop simulation. So you're simulating the physical world, but the embedded system believes that it's interacting with the real world, but it's not. And then you get challenges on computations. You need to do these simulations in real time, which can be very demanding. Okay, so these are some of parts of, of looking at models on cyber physical systems. And if you go in other direction, you of course you create physical prototypes and then you do implementation. And, and, and then that, that part there you can talk about synthesizing from models down to, to the real system. But let's focus on the equation-based modeling part for now. So now take a very simple physical model, a, a pendulum, and it's simple to describe it. Actually, the, the machinery to set this up is it, not that simple. And especially if not if you're modeling this in Cartesian coordinates. So in that case, you have here two differential equations, basic expression uh, Newton's law in X and Y direction. You have some initial values for this. And, and we have a constraint here, basically expressing the trajectory of this, uh, of the, of the possible dynamics of the system. And if you would express this in, in, a, in our language here, you can express it like this, the panel. And what you can see here without diving into the details is basically that the equations here are just typed right, exactly as the equations done in math. And this is an example of, of, of declarative model. So we, we don't express, express here how you actually do it. You don't say, you know, okay, here I use Runge-Kutta to do the numerical approximation, but you describe the model as equations. So the order here doesn't matter and you can manipulate them. And these kind of equations called DAEs, differential algebraic equations. So it's basically differential equations extended with, with algebraic constraints. So this is an algebraic constraint, for example. And here the prime prime is the second uh, order derivative. Of that. So here's a, a model, an equations, equation based model that can be simulated and, and executed with the purpose of being expressive. So you can then afterwards select which kind of solver you use. So if we take this another, at this, another step and try to compose together bigger systems. So here's an example of a, of a simple control system, a uh, mechatronic system. Um, uh, where you have a causal connection here. So we're measuring the speed of some rotating domain. And um, here we have an example of an A causal connection. And this is the special thing for these equation-based object-oriented languages. So, so we are developing DSLs for this. Uh, I've been earlier involved in the specification of Modelica, which is a, a kind of more industrial strength, very complex, very, it's got a lot of things, but also it's pretty limited in some of the expressiveness. So what we are, here exploring our, our different ways to make it more expressive and have simpler language constructs. And so a, a causal means here that it's not a causal about time, but it, it's about information flow. So you see that this shaft affects 
the gear and the motor and the gear and motor affects the shaft. So the direction of flow is not one, one way. And in the end, this kind of models boils down to one big equation system that is solved. And that's why you have these uh, bidirectional part. So here we have some electrical components, some mechanical component and some control component. It's a PID controller. So what we see here is, is the model in a textual form. So this will be a programmatic model. Uh, it's described here. You see that the wiring together is we did on this nose. You can see in the picture and in the actual textual model, the R1 here, is wiring together two components, the DC motor and, and the gear. Here's an example also of a higher order a model. So you see here that this shaft component is sent in as an argument to this serialized function. So the serialized function is just taking this component and then putting five of them in series. So you don't have to model this explicit, but you can then use more a programmatic way. So those of you who are used to functional programming, this is a more like a functional approach where you have can, uh, can uh, pass models as arguments as, as, as first class citizens. So this is the DC motor and that is defined then in a different model where you have its interfaces. And if we look at one part in this motor, you have an inductor, which is defined in another model. So you see you get a hierarchy of models. And in the end here, in the inductor, we have an equation. So in this kind of equation-based models, you always have equations defining the models in the end. So, but it's a structured way how to compose this so you can reuse components and build bigger and bigger models. Okay, so if we now look at, at a, a bigger, a bit more complex domain, it, it's a multi-body domain. So, so this is a collaboration with uh, one of, of my students and uh, uh, Oscar. And uh, here, this is about interactive programmatic models, basically that you describe models in a very precise and small, uh, I mean, short, uh, way, and then that you can get automatic visualizations. So if we look at one model here, uh, this is a model uh, where we have a, a name, give it a name, we connect it to a world component. We are combining this in series, so we have serial composition, and then we have the different components. So here you see a joint and a bar. And under the hood here, this generates a complex equation system that is then solved, approximated, uh, and there are different kinds of automatic differentiations going on. And then you, in the end, do a numerical approximation and you can visualize it or, or plot it. So here is a visualization then of this model. So, so the point here is that you, you can be very expressive and describe exactly what you want with the model. And then you can use this to, to evaluate and simulate the system. And here you see that it's just going on and on and on. There is no friction. Okay, so here's another model. And now since this is over uh, Zoom, it's kind of hard to be interactive, but uh, maybe you can think a little bit about what is this model? If you just look at the code here or the programmatic model, what is it? You have some of it, you have some joint, some bar, some joint again, some bar, right? What can it be? Well, it, it's a double pendant, right? So I just connected two bars in series. And, and this is actually a pretty fun uh, model. If, you, if you've seen double pendulums before, it's got a very chaotic behavior. So it, it's totally, uh, the initial values can and changes the trajectory considerably. Okay, so, we, we talked about composing things in series, but you can imagine that you want to design a language where you can compose in parallel as well. So if you look at this then, you have something in series and then parallel and parallel. What does it mean? What is the meaning of this model? Well, it actually depends on the precedence of these operators. It's not obvious what it means. So if we would, have the precedence as, as this, this would be the visualization of the model. But if we change so that 
the this one has higher precedence putting in the parentheses the whole topology of the model changes so you see that text is very expressive but just sm small light slightly slight changes changes the whole overall structure of the model so now of course we see one these are just abstract things i'm saying just compose these things in parallel and if you change it like this a parenthesis there you get these things in series and then you have c3 and c4 in power and so forth there are different alternatives so one thing that one of my students victor is, is working on is on this problem how to kind of postpone the decision of about making decisions of ambiguity in languages later because current state of art basically forces you to do make these changes this this choice is already when you're designing the language, but this is problematic if you you have uh, if if the precedence of the language or the operators are not really obvious to you. Like plus and minus in algebra is obvious, but other operators are not. Okay, going back to the pendulum here. Um, now we added a component with a parallel operator here. So here we say that we have a revolutionary joint and the a damper in parallel, and the rest is, is the same. Okay, so if we run that one, we still have the double pendulum, but you see that the behavior is a little bit different. So we have a damper, and that's why it slows down. We didn't have any damping or friction before, and that's why it was basically just going on and on. But this one stops. And here I, I just we just played with a crazy system where, where, where you have some spheres also so that, that they can actually rotate in, in all directions. So, so the point is that you can model very rapidly complex models. Yes, it looks like a clown. Okay, so how do we do this? What, what is actually under the hood going on here? Well, there, there are some static and dynamic semantics of a system. You have DSLs, uh, libraries where you compose together and, and models. And, and you have type checking and, and other kind of mechanisms that you can do at compile time. And then at, at runtime, you do different kinds of analysis and then interpret or compile and run model in the end. So in this kind of DSLs, you're actually doing numerical approximation using some implicit or explicit solver uh, in the end. And, and you can think about the parts can be done in shallow embedding. It means that you basically reuse constructs from the host language that is called shallow embedding. Or you do deep manipulation where you transform these, these kind of things. So, so typically you want to combine this, but what do we call these things when we combine shallow and deep? Shallow and deep, sheep, sheep maybe. Sheep embedding, well, that's, maybe not that fair for the animals and but it's kind of cheap embedding it's it's a way that you want to be able to to embed things in a in a cheap way meaning that it's easy for you as a dsl developer that you can reuse different things and then still be expressive enough okay and that these things can have many different names of course in the literature so in, in this case, we have defined formal semantics. I will not go into that. Uh, and it, it, it's based on, on a gradually typed lambda calculus. And, and for those of you who are interested in languages, uh, it, it's a small step operation semantics. And uh, there's a type system and a type soundness proof of this. And this, this work is done together with uh, Jeremy Seek, uh, who was at Boulder uh, and is now at Bloomington. Okay, so, so I've talked now about the different ways of doing equation-based modeling. And, and now I just want to jump in over to a, a, a project that is related to this, uh, that we are doing uh, in the context of digital futures. And there are a number of uh, PIs involved in this. So in this project, the overall research objective is to develop new techniques, methods, and tools to control com complex dynamical systems. So we're still on, on dynamical systems, but using limit number, limited number of data samples and structured information. So the key thing here is dynamical systems and limited number 
or data centers. So it's kind of an interdisciplinary project. So I'm involved from the language and compiler point of view, and there are people from control, system education, and reinforcement learning uh, involved in this project, but also uh, on the biotechnology part. So the things that we are uh, working on in this project, and it, it's kind of started with, with a pilot project uh, uh, last year, and it's about continuous bioprocessing. Uh, this is together with the company so Sobi. And I'm personally not that involved in this part of the product, but it's about continuously, continuously being able to harvest uh, uh, bioproduction. And, and it becomes a complex control problem where you can only sample data from the system limited number of times. The other part is on uh, reinforcement learning of cyber physical systems. And, and this is also we are collaboration with ABB, uh, both on, on container automation but also on uh, robots. And we were talking here about more the physical movements of robots and how to learn them to, to move. I'll say some, a few more words about that. And, and then the other part is about the reinforcement learning in mobile networks with very limited amount of possibility to, to, uh, to probe the system. So, so in this project, uh, we have Veronique involved in biology, Hawken in in, in uh, automatic control, so I got in, in, in uh, signal theory, Alexander Poutier in the reinforcement learning and myself. And the, these people are involved in the continuous bioprocess and, and we are starting up this on the CPS part. So just to give an idea what we're doing on the CPS part here. So, so you have some sort of physical system. So we are, you know, you're always starting up with, with uh, some simpler system that you know have a well behaved behavior. And, and the key property here is to do this equation-based modeling. So, so that, I, that I explained before. So you, you want to model uh, in first principle what you know about the systems and the dynamics of the system so that you can do physical simulation. And when you have this physical simulation, you want to learn the system, but you're not really training on the system. You're training on simulations of the dynamics of the model. And this is the also key thing here that the model is not the system, right? So you will learn and maybe be, become very good at performing your tasks on the model, but that doesn't mean that you will be good in, in the physical reality. So then you want to excite the system to see how it behaves when you're actually exciting the real system. And here comes one of the key properties is about parameter estimations. So, so then you want to estimate the parameters of the equation-based model so that it gets better fit for for the, for the real system. And then you update the model. So the, 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 the approach that we're exploring this, in this part of the product is to combine these different kind of things where you are basically training against a, a simulated model, but the simulated model we want to have as high fidelity as possible uh, and adjust it using parameter estimations. And, and here, this space is, is kind of huge because you can think about just, just estimating parameters, say, say inertia and so on for, for different components, but you can also think about uh, estimating the structure, part of the structures. But the, the key thing in this is what we're exploring that we also know things about the system, because if you would do this uh, totally black box, you, it will be very hard, even if it's hard. Anyway, okay. So that's what I want to say about, about the equation-based part. Uh, let's jump over to some, some part on the probabilistic programming part. So what is a probabilistic program? Well, we've talked about models. And a normal program, you have an input and an output. A probabilistic program can be seen as that you are doing the reverse. You are observing the output, and then you are inferring the input or, or actually the parameters. So by observing something, you're inferring something that you cannot observe. And the probabilistic program here is really a model and you can see it as a programmatic model. So if you have a model and an inference algorithm, you try to separate these two things because as a modeler, you might not want to have a PhD in, in knowing, understanding all different kinds of inference algorithms to be able to solve your problem. 
And you can think about a, a, of a universal probabilistic program as a generalization of a Bayesian network. So it, it's basically Bayesian probabilistic models. And different kinds of inference algorithms could be, as a, for example, SMC, sequential Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo, or stochastic variational inference. But if you have these two parts, then you want to generate an inference program that can run efficiently to get data and then infer and do estimations. So the key thing here is to separate the concerns and still be able to produce a very efficient program. And, and since it's, it's, it's using in these uh, Monte Carlo methods, um, we actually do not, do not get point estimate, but rather estimations of, of the distributions. So PPLs are, are not new, but it kind of emerged quite recently to be a very hot topic. It is the second uh, international conference uh, on policy programming. It's at MIT now in a couple of weeks. Um, there have been a lot of languages like bugs is, is, uh, was developed many years ago. Uh, Stan is popular in, 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 in uh, statistical uh, communities and so forth. So these, the blue ones are more kind of classic Bayesian network kind of style. Whereas the top ones here are more, which is sometimes called universal in the sense that they can express uh, more expressive models, but it also gets harder to get, to make them really efficient. And we are working on then domain specific languages on, on, uh, on the upper part here, uh, the universal part. And we're defining a core language that will say a few more words about here. So, so this is something that uh, is together with uh, Daniel and, and Joey. And the goals of this is to, to have a core in, in this miking environment that I'm going to talk about later, um, so that you can create more, even more domain specific language on top of this. So why would you like to do that? Well, it's that you don't want to reinvent the wheel every time you want to have some more domain specific uh, language for a specific domain. And, and uh, one such language is three people that we are uh, collaborating on. So you want to do different things. We have developed uh, something called delayed sampling published a few years ago. It's an optimization technique in this domain, uh, different kind of static analysis uh, with resampling alignment is one technique. And, and another thing is to compile this efficiently to, to and be able to paralyze it. So. Uh, we, or specifically Joey, has developed this, this uh, intermediate language for GPUs that turns out to be, uh, have significant performance gains compared to, to state of art. Okay, so uh, just to get a feeling of what, what is probabilistic programming, let's have a very, you know, hello world kind of example in uh, probabilistic programming. So here you have a sample construct and it samples from the beta distribution. And, and if you would run this program and just get out the p here you get the distribution of the beta distribution and for those of you who know that this looks a little bit like the beta distribution with parameters two and two um, if you if you look at this uh, and you run it with more particles so if you're using this method called sequential Monte Carlo, you get different approximations you get a better and better approximation of this this distribution but here we just you know sampled from a distribution which is not very interesting Let's combine this with a second uh, programming construct that's typically used in PPLs, like an observe. So here we assume that we are observing a, a true from a Bernoulli distribution. So that means that we now want to know what is the, we want to infer P given so the, the prior is that we have the beta distribution and then we observe that if we have a, a, a Bernoulli distribution when we get a true, what is then the inferred distribution for P? Okay, so if you look at that, this is the an, one approximation of it. So you see now that the distribution moved a little bit towards one because it was true but it's not sure, right? So, so giving this information, this is the posterior uh, of the inference. And if you have more coin flips, then of course you will get closer and closer to the estimate. 
So the key thing here is that the sample construct is describing random variables. And here we are observing or conditioning on some observed values. So if we continue with this and we have a, just say a normal distribution and we want to create a more complex program that is combining these two distributions. So here we are flipping a, a coin, just this is just a flip of a coin. And we have an if statement that it's either then running this and observing as we did before when we got this distribution, or we're just sampling from the normal distribution. Then the output would be a mixture distribution. So by doing this programmatically, you can express very complex models and do, then do inference, inferring different variables that you are interested in. Okay, so that was a very quick uh, intro to, to probabilistic programming. So some, some cases here. So one project we have in uh, Vinova Litticosa Center is together with Asif Skopko, um, where we then make, make use of probabilistic programming. And the problem there is, is about, uh, they, they are you know, leaders in this uh, way of tightening, tightening joints. And here you want to get a certain clamp force force putting to, together two materials. But the problem is that you cannot measure the clamp force. So you want to have a very precise clamp force without being able to measure it. So that sounds like an estimation you want to do. So, so the research problem that we are looking into here is to create how to create uh, PPL models so that we can estimate that and then get a better, better tightening. Another uh, project uh, that is one of the my PhD student uh, Gisem is working on, and this is collaboration with the uh, people from uh, uh, the University of uh, Uppsala University, and uh, specifically uh, people that are, are working in in medicine there. Uh, and it's about the uh, emergency room. So thinking that you are coming into emergency room, uh, you have you sign in and, and give different information. And then the doctor should make a decision on either discharge a patient or, or basically do more tests and getting more information. So, so the role here is not of giving, doing some sort of automatic, having an automatic doctor, but rather to help the doctor to have, provide information based on previous knowledge on, on patient records. Uh, and and uh, we recently got uh, approval from a Ethic Prevenismenheta, ethic approval, to be able to use data, uh, since this is a pretty very sensitive data, but it's anonymized. And, and some of the research challenge here is, is to define then the model to using probabilistic programming. And, in, and we're ex experimenting with variants of uh, LDA models uh, to, to be able to make this kind of inference. And one challenge here is that LDA and that kind of model is very hard to make efficient in, in state of our probabilistic programming languages. So this is also one part in this work is, is to work on the methods in to make efficient, efficient uh, inference of this kind of models. Um, another case is on phylogenetics um, inference. And um, this is together with uh, Fredrik Grundqvist at the Swedish uh, Museum of Natural History. And it's, it's basically about inference of trees. So, so if you have different kinds of um, uh, species, could be could be plants or it could be uh, animals, and you want to be able to derive the tree, or particularly you, you want maybe you have the tree, but you want to derive when in time did they separate. This is a problem that you can use uh, the statistical methods to infer. And in, in fact, uh, Frederick is, is actually a leading expert has, who has developed the Mr. Base and, and also Red Base tools that are used by most people or a lot of people in, in the field. And what we are now uh, doing is to, to define a new language, domain specific language for, for uh, phylogenetics that can express models that you cannot express with these current methods. Uh, so that hope, our hope is that this can really push the field forward. And the interesting aspect is, is, of course, the main knowledge here from Frederick and, and our knowledge about uh, probabilistic programming and compilers for that. So we, we are working on, on this uh, DSL called Treat People, 
uh, that is going to be very flexible and it's, it's basically a universal probabilistic programming language where the challenge is, is to make it really efficient because it, it, it's these these trees can be very large and we have also submitted here uh, that you can if you're interested in this about immersive probabilistic programming and statistical polynetics uh, on this topic mm? okay so the last couple of minutes i just want to say a few words about this overall things so it's called uh, uh, miking and and it, it's it's a uh, this new new tool uh, why miking it stands for meta viking because it's basically a kind of a meta programming system and i wanted to have some Scandinavian touch to it. Um, so what is it? The objective is, is basically to have a platform for constructing heterogeneous DSLs, uh, to have a type system, polymorphic type system. Uh, it bootstraps, you can write it between written in itself, produce highly efficient code, and to be able to target both real-time and distributed computations. It includes a metaprogramming and a self-learning compiler. I'll come back to that a little bit and to have a free open source. So uh, if you look at this miking platform, uh, one important part is the in interactive programmatic modeling part where you can express different programmatic models and be able to, to visualize these. Another part is, is the reuse. So, so one, one of the key things you, that you want to do is not to write everything from scratch. As you see, Many of these DSLs that we develop are, have, have things in common and you don't want to create a new infrastructure every time. Uh, so we are developing methods here for uh, composition of language fragments. So you can compose together different language fragments to create new languages. And the third part is about uh, compilation. And specifically, one part is uh, about having been to target heterogeneous platforms. That means also that to be able to compile to both CPU and GPU, because some parts cannot execute on the efficient on the CPU, uh, on the GPU, uh, whereas some part needs to be executed on, on, the, on the CPU. Other aspects here is this learning or self-learning is to, when you have information about, about the, uh, the runtime to be able to become more efficient and to optimize the model. And this is what we call an self-learning. It's actually kind of an order tuning. And, and I'm involved in all parts of this. I actually uh, really like coding. So I'm involved heavily in, in, uh, in hacking on the system, uh, but it's a major undertaking. So, so we are many people involved. So, so like Oscar is involved in, especially on, on the automatic differentiation part here. Uh, Daniel on the probabilistic programming, gives him on the probabilistic programming, especially on certain kind of inference methods. Uh, we have uh, uh, Elias working on language composition, especially on type systems, Victor on pattern uh, composition, and, and, and also on this resolve ambiguity. And Linnea uh, is working on this self learning part, the machine learning part of auto tuning compilers. Lars uh, just started and work on more on the compilation part for heterogeneous compilation. And Joe has developed this uh, the framework for, for GPUs that the past two years that it's it's really getting a good performance on on probability programming especially on the following edits okay so with that uh, i just want to conclude with uh, that we talked about programmatic models uh, and and it's basically computer programs representing models but they are still models and we talked quite a lot about also different what is a model here and um, i've introduced kind of two families. It's not like two languages, but rather families of languages uh, for equation-based languages and probabilistic programming. But of course, I just skimmed the surface. And then I said a few words about this ongoing project, open source project. So it, it's, it's there in GitHub. We haven't released the first version. So it, it's a, if you look at the actual code, you're, you are on your own. Uh, but it, it's, if you think that this sounds interesting, I would be really happy if someone just send me an email if you're interested and uh, we can talk about what that means for you. Uh, if you want to know about this vision of miking, I, I wrote a, a position paper on this. Uh, so, so if you're, it's like a four pages paper, so it's a quick read. Uh, if, so just Google a vision of miking and you will find it. With that, I just say thank you. <laughs>